1967, Aretha Franklin released what would become her signature song, which called for R-E-S-P-E-C-T, right? And uh, for her to be shown a little respect, just a little bit, right? And uh, actually, I learned that song was actually a cover and a rewrite of a song that was, the same song was recorded actually two years earlier by Otis Redding. Uh, But that song, Respect, connected very powerfully with the movement, you know, calling for uh, treating people with respect and dignity. And, uh, and uh, of course, it became uh, just a legendary uh, song in, in music history. Uh, then in 1992, you may remember Rodney King famously responding to the violent riots in Los Angeles by saying, can't we all just what? get along. Actually, his actual words was, can't we just, uh, can, can we all get along with, but that we don't, nobody remembers it that way, but, uh, but uh, that's a great question. Our culture and our society have been so incredibly polarized and divided, uh, and it seems to be getting worse and worse and worse, and often treating each other or those who disagree with us as enemies, right? Uh, without respect or dignity uh, and making unity so much harder. In some cases, almost feels virtually impossible in some, some segments of our society. But if there's anywhere in the world where that should not be the case, it should be in the local church among followers of Jesus Christ. Would you agree? One place in the world that should be different I say that because in, our, in, our, in my last message, we began to deal with one of the most divisive and controversial and emotional issues that currently exist in churches today, particularly among those who identify as fundamental Baptists. And it's not music and worship styles as challenging as that can be. It's not women's clothing styles and whether they can wear pants or not or, 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 or jewelry. It's not how formal you should dress in church. It's, not, it's definitely not about any of the fundamental doctrines of Scripture or the historic Baptist faith or even Baptist distinctives of which we agree on. But it's an issue that is directly connected to our God-given mission and is dividing God's people and hindering our efforts to reach every generation, culture, and community with the gospel. It's the issue of Bible translations. Not so much in other languages around the world, because it's amazing how much we're okay with certain principles in other languages, but particularly in the English language, particularly over the last 35 to 40 years. And if you missed last week's message, uh, please Please make time to go online, go to VandaliaBaptist.org and listen to that, please. Um, Because not only has this issue caused division and polarization in the United States of America, within churches, many times within families, between pastors and other institutions, uh, but these attitudes, as I mentioned uh, in my last message, and positions are actually being now exported overseas and bringing heartbreaking division on the mission field between missionaries, between national pastors who used to work together, between everyday Christians. That's why I want to do my best with God's help and grace to guide us as a church to equip you as a believer to face this issue honestly and humbly and respectfully, but more important, biblically. And it's crucial that we do so and talk about this issue in light of the big picture, in light of the great commission of our God-given mission. So we began this series entitled God's Word for God's Mission. He gave us his word for a, with a purpose And it is essential to the mission that God's called us and given us to do. And our overall theme passage that we focused on in our last message is found, actually, we're not going to be there today. I'll be on the screen. Is is found in the Gospel of Luke, Luke's account of the Great Commission, where the Bible says this. 
in Luke 24. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, concerning Jesus. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written, thus it behooved, it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission or forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, all languages, all people groups, all ethnic cities in the world beginning at Jerusalem and we're reminded as we saw in the last message we're reminded here that God's word ultimately points to Jesus in the gospels we've got to understand that if we miss that about the bible we miss Jesus we miss the gospel we miss the whole point but we also saw that God's word is essential to God's mission and this mission implies the need to translate the scriptures which contain the gospel into every language on earth, into a language that every culture and every generation and every ethnicity, no matter where they live and when they were born, to a language that they speak, read, and understand. And in our journey, we'll be guided by two biblical principles Two of our Baptist distinctives, I spoke, explained more in our last message. Biblical authority, that the word of God is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice and belief. No traditions, no man-made document, no, no anything. The word of God and the word of God only. What it says and what it does not say. But also what is referred historically uh, by Baptists as individual soul liberty that every individual before God has the freedom and the responsibility to look to God's word and to make a decision on your own on matters of religion and of faith and what we believe. I have that freedom and so do you. And I can't take that from you or impose it on you. We have stood by that biblical principle for centuries. I laid that as well. I also kind of laid out the direction where we'll be going throughout this series and we're not going to rush through this because this issue is far too important and our mission is far too urgent. And so today we're going to begin to see that in issues like this, the Bible issues a call to respect and unity. That's going to be our focus today in Romans 14. If you could turn there with me. A call to R-E-S-P-E-C-T and unity. We'll get to Romans 14 here in just a moment, but here's why. Before we can even begin talking more specifically about this issue, about how God gave us his word, about the challenges of translation that we're going to be focused on in, in, in the coming weeks, we first must let God remind us of how to even talk about this as believers and as a church family. How to deal with issues that are hard, that are very personal for each one of you and me, and that are even emotional, in which God-fearing, mature believers disagree without tearing each other down, causing division, and hurting the work of God and the advancement of his mission. Yes, the Bible deals with this. So that is where we're going to start. I want us to take some time to learn some principles that the Apostle Paul lays out in Romans chapter 14. And before we do, I want to remind you of what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 133 when he said, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in what? Unity. For there... There, where there's unity among believers, the Lord commanded the blessing and even life forevermore, eternal life, eternal blessings. That's where God sends it. Respect and unity among God's people, just like Jesus prayed for on the night before he was crucified, uh, is or what pleases God and what unleashes his blessings from heaven. Sadly, what has developed around this issue 
specifically around the King James only movement, not the King James itself, but around this issue and the debate is the exact opposite. In pulpits around the country, on social media, among Christians, we have seen development of what I refer to as toxic attitudes. And I don't just mean on one side of the debate. <laughs> you see it on both sides, on, on any side of the issue. But I've got to be honest, some of the most toxic, mean-spirited, condescending, offensive, and ungodly language and attitudes that I have personally witnessed and experienced have come from within the KJV-only movement. I remember, I won't give you any details, but I remember one time when our family was on furlough from Columbia, and, and we were in the United States, and we went to a vacation Bible school, and uh, and there was kind of obviously VBSs for kids. And, and during, uh, I don't know if it was the midweek service or whatever, they had everybody together and had the evangelist come. And, and the whole thing he talked about was about this issue, about the King James Version and, and, and uh, you know, and laying out his beliefs about it. But I don't know what that had to do with VBS or not, but that's, that's where it was. And I remember that. And one of the things I remember as he was talking and being very adamant and very vocal and very emotional, I remember him talking about having no problem spitting on these newer translations and burning them and throwing them into the trash because it's not really God's word. That's not the only time I've heard that, that type of language, but that was decades ago, but I've never forgotten it. And it sickens me to this day. I can still remember. I, there's a lot about my past. You guys know that. I don't remember. But I remember that. And I wish it was an isolated event. And I hope that you've never had to be exposed to those types of toxic attitudes around this issue. But many of you probably have. Last week, I don't know if you recall, I remember how I mentioned how in politics, you know, conservatives think that liberals are wrong, but liberals think that conservatives are what? Evil. <laughs> That's right. They're evil. They're the enemy. And unfortunately, when defending the King James Version at times as the Bible and as, as the, the only Bible the English speakers should use today or, or ever... The only translation, you know, that can be called the pure word of God, people at times have resorted to attacking the character, the integrity, the spirituality, and the doctrine of purity of Christians, of preachers, of pastors, of scholars, of theologians, of translators, of churches, of institutions, anybody that have chosen to use or develop a Bible translation in a language that today's English speakers can read and speak and understand. But I say that, but at the same time, many who use newer translations often develop resentment and bitterness and sarcasm towards those who insist only on the KJV. In other words, toxic attitudes can go both ways. Am I right? So let's turn to Romans 14. And begin by understanding their issues. Why do we need to do that? Because anytime you want to read and study and understand a passage of scripture, you've got to get into the world in which it was written. The people who wrote it, what they said, the people who read it, what they were living and experiencing, and what this meant in their day. Otherwise, what you read will either not make any sense to you or you might not think it's important or you might not think it's relevant to what you're going through today. Why do I say that? Because you could read Romans chapter 14 and think it has absolutely nothing to do with Bible translations or KJV onlyism or other hot button issues like tattoos or body piercings or worship styles or, 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 or women's clothing or hairstyles or how formal to dress in church. And you say, it doesn't have to do anything to do with any of those things. But it does. I hope that today you begin to understand that this chapter is not only relevant, but it is essential 
If we are going to deal with this issue and any other difficult issue in a way that is truly pleasing to God and that follows his word above all. Their issues were referred to as doubtful disputations. In other words, arguments and disagreements and disputes, and they weren't arguing about doctrine or about clearly defined biblical truths, but about differences of opinion and thought and preferences and guidelines and standards. And and when it came to applying God's word that is eternal, these unchanging truths and principles to the countless matters of culture and faith and everyday life. There were two groups, as we're going to see here, Let me begin by reading the first three verses because, uh, actually, let let me back up for a second. We're not going to get to all the principles here in this chapter today, but it's important that we be on the same page with what is here in the scriptures uh, because this passage has kind of been a reference point to me, for me, uh, for a large portion of my ministry. And I wish I could tell you, that I have always lived out these principles in my personal life, with my family, raising my kids, uh, or in our, my ministry as a missionary, as a pastor. I wish I could say that, but I can't. The truth is, I struggle and wrestle with issues like anybody else does. And I can be stubborn, and I can be narrow-minded, and I can be arrogant, and I can be condescending with people that I, if I think I'm right. But anytime I am any of those things, I'm not pleasing God, and I'm not furthering his mission. I have had to learn to accept some things that I didn't before. But it's amazing to experience the freedom and clarity that comes when you truly allow God's word to speak for itself without reading anything into it that we want to and being honest about many things that the Bible does not say. And so to understand Romans 14, we got to understand their issues. Because these issues may not mean much to you today. They don't keep you up at night. But to them, these issues were huge. They were huge. These were issues that were so important to them that they couldn't imagine how a God-fearing, Scripture-loving believer could possibly have a different position and still please God. Couldn't wrap their minds around that. And you begin to see this tension in the opening verses of this chapter. Look what verses 1, 2, and 3 say. Romans 14. Look at it for yourself. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. He refers to their issues as as doubtful disputations. Again, disagreements, arguments, disputes, but they weren't about doctrine. They weren't about clearly defined biblical truths, but about differences they had when it came to their guidelines and standards and how to apply God's word to all of these other issues that we deal with. And there are two groups here of believers within this church in Rome. They were referred to as the strong and as the weak. The strong, which seems to have included Paul, were those who seemed to exercise more freedom and fewer rules and restrictions in certain areas of the Christian life. Then those who were referred to as weak seemed to be those who held themselves to much stricter lifestyle standards to keep their hearts and lives pure from worldly, pagan, ungodly influences in their day. So they had a lot more, a lot stricter rules and standards that they lived by. For good reason. The strong and the weak. But what I want you to understand is this was not about spiritual versus unspiritual. Okay? This was not mature versus immature. This was not godly versus ungodly. Not at all. They were simply applying principles of the word of God differently. But their attitudes on both sides were toxic. They were being argumentative as we see there in verse 1. 
Then we see in verse 3, they were judging and condemning on one side, and the other side were being resentful and bitter towards the others who held different positions. We see there in verse 3. We also read throughout the chapter that they were being condescending, and they were acting superior to those who they disagreed with. There in verse 10, it says, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set at naught thy brother? We'll talk more about that later. And as a result, God's work was being destroyed over these secondary issues. In verse 20, he says, for meat, destroy not the work of God. The two biggest issues for them that Paul addresses in this specific chapter are meat and holy days. Or you might say food and feasts. First of all, it was the issue of food. Food issues came up in two different ways. On one hand, the Jewish law forbid people from eating certain foods, you know, like pork and, and reptile meat, which were considered unclean. That's why Peter had such an issue in his heart and, and was so judgmental and condemning and, and, and everything uh, towards the Gentiles. And Paul, God had to address that within him and with his own heart, his own prejudices in Acts chapter 10. But the Gentiles had no problem eating meats of all kinds. But then the other issue, probably the most controversial, was that some Gentile Christians living uh, in a pagan society like Corinth and like Rome, they would go to street markets and they would see the vendors selling meat or leftover meat that had been used in pagan sacrificial ceremonies to false, to idols. And some believers, you read about that in 1 Corinthians 8, some believers believe that eating meat, that meat, buying that meat, even if it wasn't a discounted price, buying that meat and eating that meat for some believers, that was supporting and condoning those wicked practices and would not be pleasing to God. So they refused to do so, like boycotting today. We're not going to do that. We're not going to buy them. We're not going to give them our business. In fact, many of them settled for, for just eating vegetables. Let's just play it safe and we'll all be vegetarians. That's, that's what they did. But other Christians would buy the meat. Following Paul's principle that he lays out in 1 Timothy 4, where he says that every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. He says, because it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. And so Paul would eat it. But you can imagine the passionate disagreements between these Christians in many churches and many cities about their food choices and standards. They felt very strongly about this. The other issue was the issue of feasts or holy days. And they're going to make reference to this. Because not only did God's people observe the Sabbath principle but for the Orthodox Jews, there were all sorts of holy days and memorials and feasts and which the Jews had been honoring for hundreds of years from the law and beyond. Each feast had its own elements and its own traditions and, and its own value and significant and, uh, and, and, and meaning to them, and, uh, which had just grown and accumulated and developed over time in one generation to another generation. And for many believers, especially Jewish believers who came to faith in Christ, it was important to keep doing that, to continue setting aside these days of the year for holy purposes. But other believers saw them as just another day. They didn't do it out of disrespect. They didn't do it out of rebellion. They didn't do it out of worldliness. They just saw it differently as they sought to please God. Look at verse 5, and we'll get to that down the road. Verse 5 says, One man esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. That's individual soul liberty, by the way. They simply applied God's principles differently where it was not clearly expressed from these New Testament Christians. But nothing stirs your passions more than the personal and religious traditions that you hold because they're so personal and so important and so meaningful. 
No, in Romans 14, they were not arguing over Bible translations or the exclusive use of one translation or another, but they might as well have been. So Paul confronted these believers in Rome and throughout this chapter, chapter helps us to understand what God expects of us. When it comes to Bible translations, does God expect Christians to just part ways, to go to different churches, to only fellowship and partner with those who are just like us? Is that what reflects God's heart? Is that what reflects the reality and truths and the power of the gospel? Is that what will further advance God's mission? In Romans 14, Paul lays out seven simple yet practical principles that we must understand and we must commit to following as God's people as we talk more about God's word for God's mission. No, we're not going to cover all of these today, but I just want to at least begin with the first one. And principle one is simply this. Embrace those who have different convictions. Embrace those who have different convictions. Look back at verses one and two. He says this. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Again, Paul is not referring to someone who's unspiritual or ungodly. Their motivation was good and commendable. They genuinely believed that their position was best. But they simply saw things differently than you and me. How should we handle this? Paul says in verse 1, Receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. That Greek word translated receive in the KJV means to take for yourself, to, to take as one's companion, to receive into your home, to accept into friendship. Isn't that awesome? That's how we are to relate to those who have different convictions. In the English Standard Version, it was translated in Romans 14 as, for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Despite our differences as believers in Christ, he says here that we should embrace and have fellowship and friendship and companionship uh, and, and unity with each other as friends, as brothers in Christ, as members of the body of Christ, not to reject or exclude one another. We should treat our brothers and sisters of the, in the faith with tenderness and friendliness, not with a cold shoulder or with superiority. That's what he's saying. But this is the exact opposite of what often happens over this issue, especially among pastors and ministry leaders. We tend to separate ourselves from those who we disagree with, even on non-essential matters, even on secondary uh, doctrines. Independent Baptist famously quotes 2 Corinthians 6 where it says, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. We just separate ourselves, even though that, like most other verses, are totally taken out of context. That is not what God's saying to come out from among other Christians and separate yourself from other Christians. But we pride ourselves in being separate and dividing we break fellowship, we keep our distance, we even find other places to worship so we can only surround ourselves with people that see things just like we do. Many times it's easier. But is it biblical? That is clearly not how God is instructing us through his word as Christians to get along and to deal with issues where there are differences of conviction. Not only does he tell us to, to welcome and embrace these other brothers, but Paul also instructs us to avoid doubtful disputations with fellow believers. In other words, receive them, but not to fight with them. You know, 
there are people who love arguments and debates, especially on social media when someone can't talk back. <laughs> and I, and I, I will step up to many on argument at times. But Paul warned Timothy and Titus against those who devote themselves to endless discussions and disputes. He says that in 1 Timothy 1 and Titus chapter 3. This is a repeated issue that he confronts because I guess human nature hasn't changed. They say they want to receive their brother but seek every opportunity to argue with their brother. They're not satisfied until everyone else has agreed with them. Have you known people like that? But that attitude does not please the Lord. I don't care if you're a pastor or a missionary or a Bible teacher or a deacon or a bus driver. It doesn't matter. God expects us to embrace one another in Christ. To treat each other with genuine love and respect and to unite around our mission, around the gospel. Let me be crystal clear This is not a call to compromise Bible doctrine. Nor to tolerate the defiance of clearly defined biblical truths. That's not what this is. There's only one gospel. And God's revealed word never changes. Regardless of time, culture, popularity, or convenience. It's the eternal word of God. God's word is not up for an opinion poll or a democratic election. Even if 90% of the congregation were to vote to accept something that is clearly defined and addressed in scripture, it would still be wrong in the sight of God if we go against God's word. Or if our own guidelines and policies and rules and constitution or other traditions holds a position that violates the principles of God's word, then our standard and our choice should be obvious. But this is not what Paul's talking about here. He's not talking about doctrinal differences. He's not talking about those who who are trying to promote a different gospel. He has a whole different approach to that problem. But that's not what he's talking about here. When it comes to handling our differences with fellow God-fearing Christians, we are to embrace those who have different convictions. And Paul says so much more throughout the rest of this chapter that we don't have time to get to today, but we're going to see more in our next message. Let me encourage you to, to read this passage this week through this lens. Allowing God to remind us of things that we need to be reminded of. That help give us guidelines and boundaries and what's acceptable and not acceptable when it comes to dealing with difficult issues. Especially those who impact, that which impact our mission. God's mission is too important God has given us his eternal word to accomplish that mission. The truth is the eternal destiny of billions of people is at stake of whether we carry out that mission. We must not only stand on God's word, but we must be committed to taking God's word to a lost and dying world, to every generation, to every culture, and every community, near or far in a language that they can understand so they can respond to it, respond to the gospel, so then they can begin to grow and mature as disciples of Jesus on their own with guidance and encouragement. That's the big picture. We are called to take his word and his message to every nation on earth. That's the big picture. That's the bottom line. So this morning, let me invite you to renew your commitment to God's mission. 
Let me invite you to pursue respect and unity with other believers in our church and outside of our church who see things differently than you, but who love Jesus, who love God's word, and are committed to the same cause, to the same faith. And if necessary, let me invite you to repent of and confess if there's been any attitudes that you may have had toward those who disagree with you. Whether things you've said to someone, how you've said it, things that you've thought, things that you've had in your heart, whatever that may look like. Not just on this issue, but on any issue. May we pursue unity around the gospel and experience the blessings that God promises to send when we do. Behold how good and pleasant it is for God's people to dwell in, together in unity. For there the Lord commands his blessing and life evermore. Can we bow together, please? In Psalm 139, David prayed, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That is a prayer that we need to take before God every single day. Oh God, be honest with me, be thorough with me. Is there anything in my heart that shouldn't be there that doesn't please you? Are there any ways in which I have attitudes that are not pleasing to you? Are, things that, are there things that come out of my mouth at times that don't edify and build others up, that don't minister grace to those who hear those words? Father, I pray that today you would give us greater clarity about what truly matters and about how urgent it is that we make that the main thing and our primary focus. Father, we may have differences in what language at times to use to communicate the gospel to people who don't know you. And to even receive your word personally. But God, I pray that you would give us a growing love for you, for your word, and for people who will face eternity without you if they don't hear and understand the message of the gospel. Whether they live here or anywhere in the world. Father, give us unity around your heart. Father, there could be someone here today who's never opened their heart to Jesus. Doesn't matter how much they know about the Bible, what they believe about the Bible. But God, if they don't know you in a personal way, They're facing eternity without you. And God, I pray that today they would humble themselves before you and open their heart to you to receive forgiveness and salvation. So God, we pray for grace. We pray for unity. We pray for compassion and grace as we follow you together as your people. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we stand together, please, as we have this time to respond to God? I don't know if God has spoken to you about something today. Can we take this time to respond back to him?
there's anything in your heart that you want to express to God or take care of before him, then you do that. If there's something you want to come and just bring to this altar and get on your knees and give to God, then do that. Just pray that God would give us his heart as we walk before him, live before him, and we pursue his heart and his word and his mission. If you're here and there's some other burden on your heart, need that you're going through in your life, you need someone to pray with you, why don't you come and we can pray with you together and just take those burdens, those weights to the one who can carry them and give you the grace that you need. Father, here we are as you speak. This is our moment to respond to you. In Jesus' name.